Okay, so now we are going to talk about fatty acid metabolism. And we're going to introduce fats again, talk a little bit about fed fasting, um, and mostly spend our time on beta oxidation of fatty acids or catabolism. But in regulation, of course, we will have to talk about the alternative, which is fatty acid synthesis. And so both of them are going to be alternative for, alternatively regulated similar to glucose. So you'll have glucagon, insulin, etc. And then ketone bodies will also be made in the liver during um, fasting, so we'll discuss them as well. Okay, so basically uh, the objectives are listed here to know the basics of fatty acid, biochemistry, their roles in biological lipids, for example, also their roles as um, biologic molecules. So there are active molecules that are made out of fats um, and understand the nomenclature of fatty acids, including why we call some omega-3 and omega-6. We'll talk about some basic structures of fats, um, and then we'll talk about oxidation of fats, how, to, how we break them down and generate energy from them. We'll also talk about liver making ketone bodies and releasing ketone bodies. And then we will um, finalize everything with describing the regulation of all these processes. So in general, the role of fatty acids in the body are going to be um, components of our lipid bilayer. All membranes will have fatty acids, of course, as part of their um, structure. They're also going to be a major form of stored energy. So they're going to, the stored energy form is triglycerides. Um, also known as tags, triacetylglycerol, um, etc. They are going to be precursors for, for bioactive lipids. So platelet activating factor, which does what it says, it activates platelet, is an active lipid. And also for energy. So this is beta oxidation. So for our startup, let's just talk for, first about what a fat is. Fats are hydrocarbon molecules, and they have to have a carboxylic acid at one end. For numbering, and we'll go through some numbering, the numbering of the carbon and the fatty acid always is going to begin with the carboxylic group, and then it's going to number sequentially afterwards. Um, at a physiologic pH, the carboxylic group is ionized, and so the fatty acid does have a negative charge in body fluids. However, it is so overly hydrophobic, it still needs to be carried by serum albumin when it's being, trans um, when it's being um, circulated in the body. So as we talked about before, saturated means no double bonds, hydrogens. Unsaturated means double bonds polyunsaturated is going to have multiple double bonds. There are some very important polyunsaturated fatty acids. Our essential fatty acids are omega-6 and omega-3 uh, linoleic acid and alpha linolenic acid. Um, as you increase the number of carbons, so you increase the melting point. So an 18 carbon versus a 16 carbon, the 18 will have the higher melting point. Um, between the two, for example. Um, now, you, you need to compare um, fatty acids as equally as possible. So when you compare a fatty acid with the same carbon numbers, so if you have an 18 carbon um, saturated versus an 18 carbon unsat, then your, um, your unsaturated will have a lower melting point than your saturated would have. Fatty acids less than eight carbons are liquid at physiological temperatures, whereas greater than eight carbons, they are considered a solid. Um, so some geometry associated with fatty acids, when you have a um, acyl group are oriented on the same side of a double bond, so this is in our unsaturated fatty acids, this is referred to as a cis bond majority of natural fats are going to be a cis bond. Oleic acid is an example of that. When those acyl groups are on opposite sides of the double bond, this is termed a trans, so you have those trans fats. Um, Oleic acid, which is the trans form of oleic acid, and these are going to be in foods 
um, and they're, they're developed as byproducts of the process of hydrating unsaturated fatty acids to make them more solid at room temperature. They've been associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndromes, um, and so they are, have been banned from a, by most governments in manufactured foods. So let's just talk a little bit about nomenclature. You can see here we have an 18 carbon with a zero, so that zero indicates no double bonds. So this would be a saturated. And this is steric acid. And you can see that the number one is over here by the carboxyl carbon, and then you sequentially number. And you can also note, and this is going to become important for when we do beta oxidation for orientation, the number two is the alpha carbon and the number three is the beta carbon. And so we have beta oxidation and that's because the cleavage of the carbons are going to occur in between that beta alpha um, connection. Now when you have a double bond, you are going to denote that with a delta sign. However, you still have to denote that with this nomenclature. So this 18-1 means there is one double bond. And then that delta means double bond and then nine indicates the start of the double bond. So you can see here on our example, we have carbon one and then we have carbon nine here, which has that double bond. So you have an 18-1, a single carbon, a single double bond, and the double bond starts at nine. So you know that the double bond is between carbons nine and 10. In the case down here of icosapentaenoic acid or EPA, they're gonna have five double bonds and they're gonna start at these individual positions from here. And so you have the five position, you have the eight position, the 11, we have a 14 and we have a 17. Now, uh, icosapentaenoic acid is also considered an omega-3 fatty acid. And that's because the omega end is at the opposite end of the carboxyl end. And you just number the carbon starting on that omega end. And the first double bond is going to be at that carbon three. So it's an omega-3 fatty acid. And so EPA is, is an example of a polyunsaturated fatty, fatty acid, whereas octadenic the decoic acid is a monounsaturated fatty acid. So there's some common fats in our diet or we make in our body. Palmitate is going to be a carbon 16 and this is going to be what we are going to build in our liver cells. This is the fatty acid that they build. Sterate, oleate, linoleate are also very common in, our, in all of our diets and they are shown here. So just some general um, rules, I guess, you can, you can think about for um, enzymes that have to work on these fatty acids during beta oxidation. You see that we have acyl-CoA synthases. And so these acyl-CoA synthases are going to be specific for very long chain fatty acids or long chain fatty acids, medium chain fatty acids, or our smaller acetyl fatty acids. Um, there are some comments, very long chain fatty acid, our acyl-CoA synthases are only going to be in the peroxisome. So these will not be part of the mitochondria matrix, for example. Our long chain fatty acids, medium chain fatty acids are gonna be a little bit more broadly distributed in our cells and that's because they have to work in different locations. So long chain fatty acids are gonna be associated with the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, as well as the proxosomes. And what that means is that each of those areas is where you can metabolize long chain fatty acids. Medium chain fatty acids are also going to be in the mitochondria matrix of the kidney and liver primarily because medium chain fatty acids are going to be used primarily by your liver and kidney cells. And then your cytoplasm and mitochondria matrix have um, synth synthetases that will work on acetyl groups. So where are, do we get these sources of fatty acids? Well, animal fat is going to contain both saturated and monounsaturated long chain fatty acids. Your veggie oils will contain our essential fatty acids, 
um, veggie oils are also going to contain branch chain fatty acid and odd chain fatty acid. Branch chain fatty acid have to go through the peroxisome. regardless of size um, and then your odd chain fatty acids can be either in the peroxisome or in the mitochondria depending on the, the chain size. So dairy products, veggie oils will also contain medium chain fatty acids and when you eat those, those will directly go to the kidney and the liver for metabolism. We'll make energy from those, pro those products. In the liver, excess glucose is going to be converted to that 16 carbon oops, palmitate. So that's a 16 carbon. After your liver makes this 16 carbon, it can you can add carbons to it to form other lengths, such as 18 carbons stearate. Um, the liver will produce fatty acids, and then these, of course, will be packaged into our very low density lipoproteins and be transferred to our adipose tissue. So just a little bit about our omega-6 and 3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. We have our essential alpha linolenic acid, which is our omega-3, and we have our omega-6 linol linolic acid. Um, your omega-3 omega is going to um, have three types under them. We have our alpha linolenic acid as well as our EPA and DHA, like cosapentaenoic acid and docos hexanoic acid. Um, EPA and DHA are not essential. And the reason is because both EPA and DHA can be made from um, your alpha linolenic acid, linolenic acid. Um, so ALA can form EPA and then EPA can form DHA. Plants are going to be high in these um, essential fatty acids. Fish are going to be high in EPA and DHA. Now your linoleic acid, which is your omega-6, is going to come from plants. And this is going to be very important eventually in getting to arachidonic acid. We'll have a lecture about arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is essential for um, your immune cells, it's, uh, your immune response in general. Um, and it's going to make very important um, uh, icosanoids, and we'll discuss that. But basically, you eat your plants, you get your omega-6 essential fatty acid, and then this is going to be converted to a gamma linoleic acid, and then this is going to be converted into a dihomo um, gamma linoleic acid, and then finally to arachidonic acid. Now, most of the... Um, the um, dihomo gamma linolenic acid is going to be inserted into the membrane of phospholipids at position three. So remember our phospholipids, we have our carbons, and then you have you can have a phosphate here, and then this can be ethyl phosphatidylethylamine, for example. Um, or you can have a lysine, whatever you want there. But this carbon two is often um, going to be the DGLA. And so from this, um, you're gonna have some R group here and an R group here. And so from your lipid membrane, you could pull out this DGALA and form arachidonic acid. So this can become arachidonic acid under certain conditions. And that's very important for the cell to have that stored essential omega-6 fatty acid. Let's just talk a little bit about the basic structures of most our, our common um, fats. So we have our triglycerides, our tags. These are going to be, of course, our stored form of fatty acid. Um, and we have our R groups. So you have your R, R, R3, R1, R2, R3. Um, and so these are going to be stored and again, this common for this, if this is in the membrane, what's going to be common for this R2 is to be our omega-6 fatty acid. So this is our 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, and this is the omega side, so this is our omega-6 fatty acid. So this would be a membrane lipid, for example. Stored um, tag, if you're going to make it 
in the liver will primarily be, um, again, you have your three carbons, and then you'll have your uh, palmitate. And then this will go to the adipose tissue, for example. Now our phospholipids are going to have that same backbone, those same carbons, but our phospholipids can have a phosphate group and you can have various groups attached to that phosphate group. You can make um, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethylamine, etc. And the building block of all the phospholipids is phosphatidic acid, which is just your um, three carbon, your glycerol backbone, with a phosphate group on that third carbon, and that will be phosphatidic acid. And then from phosphatidic acid, you can grow a lot of things. Um, plasmalogen is a very important structure. It's gonna be a precursor for a lot of our, um, our bio uh, lipids, lipids that have um, functions such as platelet activating factor I mentioned before. We'll have the activating factor on the next slide, I believe. So with plasmalogen, um, you have the carbon one is going to attain a fatty acid, which is going to have, it's going to look a little different than our carbon one of our tag in that you're going to have the oxygen bound to an alkyl group or an alkyl ether group. And so that's very different. And you will also have, of course, a phosphate group that can have well, many things added to it, depending on what kind of plasmalogen it is. So one such plasmalogen is platelet activating factor. So it has that carbon one um, with that special um, linkage, which is different than this carbon one. It's carbon two is actually going to have an acetyl group. So it does not have that um, long chain fatty acid on that carbon two. And then the carbon three will have that phosphate group. Um, and so this is platelet activating factor, which is important in activating platelets for clots. So we're going to talk about oxidation of our fatty acids. And so the primary sources of fatty acids to be used as energy are gonna of course be dietary. So what you take in from your diet the second is going to be the release of cellular stores from adipose tissue. And this is going to be through a process using different lipases. So in the fasting state, your adipose tissue is going to release long chain fatty acids. So those are primarily going to be those carbon 16s or whatever you took in from your diet that was packaged into your um, adipose tissue. And the long chain fatty acids are going to be um, picked up by serum albumin and then going to be transported through the blood. Your cells will take them up and then they'll be converted to a fatty acyl-CoA. Your beta oxidization is going to be a sequential order and it's going to occur over and over again depending on how long your fatty acid is. And it's going to yield energy or store energy in the form of FAD, NADH, and CoA. And then all of this is going to feed into our cycles, our TCA cycle or our electron transport chain to generate energy. So the first thing that has to happen is your adipose tissue needs to release fatty acids. And so our normal signals for um, mobilizing energy sources is going to be glucagon as well as epinephrine. They can stimulate your um, lipolysis from your adipose tissue. And this is going to activate adipose triglyceride lipase, um, which is ATGL. It's also going to activate a um, hormone dependent lysate, ly lipase. And so lipase activation is going to be um, in the process of phosphorylation because of course glucagon and epinephrine are going to activate um, protein kinase, um, or, or I'm sorry, they're going to activate kinases that phosphorylate. And so the lipases, when they get phosphorylated, are activated. There is also another protein that's important for 
the activation of not your hormone dependent lipase, but the activation of your adipose triglyceride lipase. And that is this ABHD5 um, coactivator. It's alpha beta hydrolase domain containing protein 5. And this is also going to be activated by glucagon and epinephrine. And it's not really activated, but it's, um, it's inhibitor. It gets, it's one of those that is bound by an inhibitor and phosphorylation will release that inhibition. So in order to, uh, to get access to all three of the fatty acids of your tags, you have to have three hormones, adipose triglyceride lipase, and it's that triglyceride, so it's gonna work on your tag when it has all three of your fatty acid groups. And so this is where your, your triglyceride will activate. Your hormone-sensitive lipase will activate when you have um, after your triglyceride lipase, when you have only two um, fatty acid groups, and then your monoglyceride, it's mono, and so it'll only work when there is one um, of the fatty acid groups present. And so let's just go over this. It's kind of similar, a signal transduction pathway in which we have our G protein receptor. And then of course our Ligand will be um, epinephrine, we'll put here. It could also be glucagon. Um, they both have G protein receptors. They are going to bind to different receptors, but your adipose tissue has both receptors, so it's sensitive to either of them. So those are going to be the, the two that really trigger this for the most part. Um, you then have your G proteins. We have our beta and we have our gamma complex and this will release the alpha complex so we get our activated alpha and then our alpha complex will interact with adenylate cyclase similar to what we've already talked about and then adenylate cyclase will become activated and this will convert ATP um, and it will make cyclic AMP, nothing new here. And then cyclic AMP will activate protein kinase A. So protein kinase A gets activated. Now protein kinase A will activate or phosphorylate hormone sensitive lipase. And so this will get activated. Protein kinase A also will phosphorylate our ABHD5, that's our cofactor or co-activator, and it will phosphorylate um, perilipin. Perilipin is going to be a, uh, a controller of a ABHD5. So perilipin will um, hold it. So it, it kind of, perilipin, you can think of it as sort of pearls around this fat droplet and bound to the perilipin is going to be ABHD5 molecules or proteins. And then when you have activation of your G protein receptor and phosphorylation of perilipin, it will release ABHD5. So ABHD5 can then activate your, um, uh, it, sorry, I'm going to sneeze. It's going to activate your adipose triglyceride lipase which again, that's that T for triglyceride. So you, have, you start with the triglyceride, you have activation of your um, adipose triglyceride lipase, you generate a diglyceride, your hormone, hormone sensitive lipase can work on a diglyceride, and then it generates a monoglyceride, and your monoglyceride lipase can work on a monoglyceride. Now the monoglyceride lipase is constitutive so it's always on. So if there is in the fat tissue, the, the adipose tissue, mono, um, glycerol, glycerides, your monoglyceride lipase will always remove that um, fatty acid, release it to the blood, and then release the glycerol as well. So glycerol will go to the blood, and then will go to the liver, and then will be a precursor for gluconeogenesis. which is also going to occur during the fasting state. And then your fatty acids, all of them will go to the blood. 
plus serum albumin. And then these get picked up by tissues, so go with blood. And same with this one. Okay, so all the fatty acids get released. And so these are the steps in your adipose tissue in order to release your fatty acids. So to summarize this, you have your tags, you have the different lipases that work on your tags, um, you have your tri, adipose triglycerol lipase, you have your hormone sen sensitive lipase, and then the monoglycerol lipase. And then you're gonna release all your fatty acids into the blood, and you're also going to release your glycerol into the blood. And glycerol is going to be used, picked up by the liver for gluconeogenesis, and the fatty acids are going to be transferred to the tissues, and this is going to be for energy. Now your um, liver will also pick up fatty acids to be used for energy. Okay, so here is an overview figure of beta oxidation. Um, and pretty much it starts with picking up those long chain fatty acids that are bound to serum albumin, and those were released from your adipose tissue. These long chain fatty acids have to be activated, so they get uh, a coenzyme A added to them to activate them. And then this, that occurs in the cytosol. So activation occurs in the cytosol. They're gonna, then gonna have to be transported into the mitochondria and they're gonna have to pass the inner mitochondria membrane and there is no fatty acyl CoA transporter. So they actually, once they get into the, past the outer membrane, they're gonna swap their CoA for a car carnitine, carnitine. And then the carnitine is going to be able to transport the fatty acid into the matrix and then you're gonna get swapping again for CoA in the matrix. So you're gonna regenerate your fatty acyl CoA um, in the matrix. And then the fatty acyl CoA can go through beta oxidation spiral, and then eventually it's going to um, lead to acetyl CoA. Acetyl CoA can either be go through the TCA cycle, depending on the tissue, um, and sometimes in your liver cells, you're gonna use the acetyl CoA to make ketone bodies. Okay, so let's go through each of these. Um, so cellular uptake, again, you're bound to serum albumin for transport. The membrane proteins are gonna be on most cells and they're going to have a high affinity for fatty acids. They're all gonna be part of a fatty acid receptor family. You have a fatty acid translocase. You have a plasma membrane associated fatty acid binding protein. And you have fatty acid transport proteins. Now, once you get your fatty acid inside of the cell, you have to activate it. And activation must occur in order for it to enter the mitochondria or the um, peroxisome or even get to the ER. So activation has to occur before beta oxidation. The activation is going to occur by fatty acyl-CoA synthases, synthetase. <laughs> And so these guys are basically going to um, be adding the CoA to the fatty acids. Um, so fatty acyl CoA synthetase uses um, ATP, and therefore it has a large free energy change, minus 15, so it's very favorable. Um, and then you're going to release your phosphates. You're going to release as a pyrophosphate, which will then become two inorganic phosphates, um, which this is also highly favorable. So it's overall um, is a very favorable reaction to activate your um, fatty acids. Now, once you do have a CoA added to your fatty acid, um, this can then go into different roles depending on the needs of the cell. So it can become a membrane lipid, so you can make it into a phospholipid and incorporate it into the membranes or a sphingolipid. It can also undergo back to storage. So your cell doesn't need it anymore, you start eating, go back to a fed state. Your fatty acyl coas can go back to triglycerides and then go back to the adipose tissue for storage. Or what we're gonna talk about, it can generate energy. So the fatty acyl coa formation again is a prerequisite to all fatty acid metabolism. 
You can't incorporate the fatty acid into your membrane unless it has that CoA on it. You can't go back to a triacyl, triacyl glycerol unless you have that CoA on it, etc., or it can't be oxidized. Your CoA, acyl CoA location ref, reflects the route that it's going to be taking for um, your or the um, different processes. So your TAG and phospholipid synthesis is going to occur in the ER. Oxidation, plasmalogen synthesis is going to occur in the peroxisome. And beta oxidization is going to occur in the mitochondria. Now there also is some oxidation that occurs in the ER, but it's very minimal. Okay, now the next thing you have with respect to doing the beta oxidization is you have to get your fatty acyl-CoA into the mitochondria. So the fatty acid wants to get into the matrix, so it has to go through the inner mitochondria membrane. And in order to do this, it's going to transiently attach itself to um, carnitine. The fatty acid attaches to the hydroxyl group of carnitine to form fatty acyl um, carnitine. So here's our carnitine, and here's our fatty acyl carnitine. So the reason this has to happen is because, as you know, the inner membrane is not permeable to many things, and so there are carriers or transporters for some things. So the carnitine is a transporter, so it's an acyl carnitine, carnitine, carnitine transporter, how do you want to say that? Um, so you have, again, you have your fatty acid, you're going to have your synthetase, which is going to add that CoA group, so you have your activated CoA. This can cross the outer mitochondria membrane. Your fatty acyl-CoA will interact with CPT1, which is the carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 enzyme. It will remove that CoA, release it, and add your fatty acid to the carnitine. And this is a one-to-one -one transport, so fatty acyl-carnitine goes in and a carnitine goes out, so one-to-one. -one. Inside the inner mitochondria membrane, you have the second enzyme, CPT2. CPT2 is going to take the CoA that's in the matrix and transfer it to the fatty, acyl, um, fatty acid to make the fatty acyl-CoA again, and that can go through beta oxidation. So both CPT1 and CPT2 are critical for making sure that one, make sure that the fatty acid can cross the inner membrane, and two, is to regenerate the activated fatty acid so it can undergo beta oxidation. And then that same translocase will return carnitine back into the inner membrane space so it can um, bind to another fatty acid. All right, so the stages of fatty acid oxidation are um, going to be four that are going to repeat themselves over and over again for a long chain fatty acid that is um, saturated. So the stage one is going to oxidize the acetyl residues of that um, acetyl CoA, and the stage two is going to um, take those acetyl groups that are ox uh, oxidized and push them through the TCA cycle. And then stage three will take all of the different electrons that are formed through both stage one and stage two and pass them into the electron transport chain. So stage one is our beta oxidation. This is gonna have four steps. Minimum, that repeat. And then you're gonna get your acetyl-CoA, which are gonna feed into the TCA cycle. And then you're going to get your electrons, which is gonna feed into the electron transport chain and you're going to generate a whole bunch of ATP. So the actual beta oxidation is going to have these four steps. It's going to have an oxidation step followed by hydration, another oxidation, and cleavage. And so this is the minimal for very long chain fatty acids that are un that are saturated. Sorry. Um, unsaturated that have double bonds. So there's going to be a few more steps. Branch chain fatty acids are going to have different steps, but for our very long chain fatty acids, 
um, that are saturated. These are the four basic steps that are going to repeat. Okay, so step one, again, we're talking about our palmitate. We have our 16 carbon fatty acid. And again, remember the numbering. We have carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. Our carbon two is our alpha, our carbon three is our beta. And you can see that we're this pink area is what we're going to eventually cleave off to generate our acetyl-CoA. So the cleavage is going to occur between the beta and the alpha. So the first step is going to be a dehydration. So you're going to generate a double bond between the alpha and beta carbon. So that's at C2 and C3. And this is um, going to give you a trans delta 2 enol CoA. So again, because we're 1, 2, we're doing the double bond nomenclature and it's on that two position where it starts. So it's called the trans delta two um, CoA. And this is done by acyl CoA dehydrog dehydrogenase. And this is gonna be associated with an FAD. And so keep in mind that FAD molecules are always tightly associated with their enzymes. So this FAD collects the electrons, but it's not gonna be able to donate them directly to the electron transport chain. So we'll, have to, we'll come back and talk about how these FADs get, donate their electrons eventually into the electron transport chain. Um, so because it has an FAD, this, this dehydrogenase is a flavor protein. Now there is a very long chain um, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, um, which will work on very long chain fatty acids. There is a medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase that'll work on medium chain fatty acids and a small chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. So it works on ch um, short chain fatty acids. Now you can see there's overlap between the carbons and that's because there is a little bit of flexibility when you get to um, the ends. So your very long chain fatty acids can be as small as 12 or up to 18, et cetera. And then your FAD is gonna donate electrons to the electron transport chain and AP ATP yields about 1.5. Now step two is going to be a hydration in which you're going to add water to the double bond and this will form the L-stereoisomer of um, the hydroxyl acyl CoA. And so this L form is very important because the next enzyme is very specific for that L form. Um, so your trans delta 2 enol CoA is going to have water added to it by an enol CoA hydratase. And so you add this OH group here and you lose that double bond. And so you get your L beta hydroxy acyl CoA. Step three is where you take that um, um, that L beta hydroxy acyl CoA and convert it to a beta keto acyl CoA, and this is done by another dehydrogenase, uh, the beta hydroxy hydroxy acyl CoA dehydrogenase, and this is is coupled with or it is linked with an NAD and so this time you get an NADH and the NADH is able to transfer its electrons to um, enzyme 1 of the electron transport chain and so you're going to generate 2.5 ATP from that. Now step 4 is going to be where you actually get the split of the acetyl-CoA and then you're going to generate a shorter carbon. So we had a carbon 16. So we have our carbon 16 and we're going to generate our carbon 14. Um, and this is done by a thiolase, which is a acyl, which is specifically acyl CoA acetyl transferase. Um, and it's going to go from that beta keto acyl CoA to both acetyl CoA and we're going to get maestral CoA, which is that four, 14 carbon. Um, Acetyl-CoA enters the TCA cycle, or oxaloacetate, plus this goes to citrate. And then this is gonna generate um, many ATP um, by feeding in through the TCA cycle. So all of these steps are gonna repeat over and over again. So we had our, our carbon 16, we went to a 14, we do four more steps. And we get our 12, we do four more steps. And we do our 10, four steps. And then we do our six, etc., etc. From each of these, you're going to get um, acetyl CoA plus 
your FADH2 plus NADH um, all the way through, and so those are going to generate energy as well. And you're going to be left with the final acetyl-CoA. So the beta oxidization, again, for your saturated long chain fatty acids are going to do sequential um, cleavages of two carbons, and that will give you acetyl-CoA. Um, and then, of course, before cleavage, you have the beta carbon is oxidized, and so you're going to generate your FAD, and then you're going to also um, add um, water and eventually generate your NADH as well. In each cycle, of course, you get two carbons shorter. Cleavage of the last four here is um, uh, of the uh, fatty acyl CoA, call, which is called butyryl CoA, produces the final two acetyl CoAs. And so, even chain fatty acid is 16 carbons, and so you get cleaved seven times. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so you don't cleave that last eighth time because you want to keep those carbons together. So it's seven times. And so you're going to produce seven FADs, seven NADHs, and eight acetyl CoAs. Now, those FADs again can be transferred directly to the electron transport chain. So there's a few steps that need to take place for you to get those FAD electrons into the electron transport chain. And those are going to be um, a sequential transfer of those electrons. So you have the acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, which is the flavor protein that has the FAD, and it's going to pick up um, the electrons. Um, and then the dehydrogenase is going to transfer those electrons to the electron transferring flavor protein, which is this ETF. And then ETF is going to transfer those electrons to the ETF coenzyme Q reductase. So that's this one here. And that's going to have an FAD that picks up those electrons. And then that is going to transfer that to coenzyme Q in the electron transport chain. So in general, the energy that's yielded in beta oxidization is going to be eight acetyl-CoAs. Um, you're also going to have seven NADs that each have 2.5, so you get 17.5 ATP. You have seven FADs, so you get 10.5 ATP from them. If all eight go through the TCA cycle, you're going to get up to 80 ATP made. And so this is going to help generate a lot of energy during your fasting stage. So now enzymes are going to be specific for different fatty um, Enzymes are going to be different from each of the fatty um, acids. They're different chain, chain lengths. So there's a table, and it's in the book, and it's also in this slide. Um, in general, the long chain fatty acids are going to be worked on by those enzymes that bind to long chain fatty acids. And as they get shorter, they're going to be transferred to enzymes that act um, on the shorter chains.
Sorry about that. I had to let my dog out. Okay, sorry. So I was talking about chain lengths. So yes, you have different enzymes that work on different chain lengths. Um, you also have, we're going to talk about where you're going to have um, branch chain fatty acids and very long chain fatty acids that are going to be oxidized in the peroxisomes. And so they're going to generate medium and short chain fatty acyl CoAs, and they can be transferred from peroxisomes um, to the mitochondria and continue to um, be processed in the mitochondria, for example. So this is a table about the different enzymes. And so we have different classes of enzymes. We have the acyl-CoA synthetases, and then we have the acyl transferases, and you have acyl-CoA dehydrogenases, and then you have a series of other enzymes. And so if you look at your acyl-CoA synthases, you have um, the synthases for very long chain fatty acids, and these are only gonna be in the peroxisome, so that's why they have to go through the peroxisome. You're going to have your long chain fatty acids that are going to be present in the endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, peroxisomes. And that's because when you have your very long chain fatty acids, say carbon 26, and it gets down to a carbon um, 18, it can then be worked on in the peroxisome by a long chain um, synthetase instead of the very long chain synthetase, etc. And so medium chain are going to have very various variants, and they're going to be mostly present in the mitochondria matrix of the kidney and liver. Um, medium chain synthetases are also going to be important in exenobiotic metabolism, and what that means is that our exenobiotics, our drugs and things, have to be metabolized, and our medium chain synthetases can help to break those down in the liver. Um, you have your acyl transferases, you have your CPT1, um, and then you have your carotene acyl transferase as well. You also have a median chain transferase. This is an octanal carotene transferase, and this is going to be important for um, medium chain fatty um, CoAs generated during the peroxisomes because they're going to be released and then they're going to have to get into the mitochondria. <laughs> The dehydrogenases, again, are going to be very long chain, long chain, medium chain, or short chain. Um, and so you're going to have different variations of your dehydrogenases. And then you also have um, other enzymes that are going to be important for your um, processing of other fats. Okay, so we talked about a saturated fatty acid. So now let's talk a little bit about unsaturated fatty acids. So unsaturated fatty acids are going to have the double bonds. And so oleate, for example, is a carbon 18 with one double bond at between 9 and 10. Linoleate is going to be two double bonds, etc. Um, beta oxidation occurs, as we just described, for the saturated fatty acids in the unsaturated fatty acids until the double bond is reached. And then, in order to continue beta oxidation, your cis double bond must be isomerized to a trans or it has to be reduced. So this is just an example of what happens. So again, this is a 18-carbon um, linoleate, which has a double bond at the 9 and 12 positions. And so basically, you do beta oxidization all the way until you get to that double bond. Um, and then you have a cis um, delta 3 and a cis delta 6. And so here, keep in mind, remember that we started out with the delta 9, delta 12, but as we decrease the um, number of carbons, your double bonds are now shifted in the numbering scheme. So again, this is your carbon 1, your 2 is your alpha, your 3 is your beta, and so this is why it's called a cis delta 3, because 3 is the bond starts and also a delta 6 because that 9 now has gotten or that 12 now has gotten closer to. So what this means it's going to be worked on by a delta 3, delta 2 enol CoA isomerase. Um, so it's working um, it's an isomerase that's basically going to take the delta 3 bond so this is our delta 3 right and it's going to generate a delta 2 trans. So now we have a trans delta 2 and a cis delta 6. 
And so you're going to have to, there's going to be a few additional steps um, in dealing with your, um, your trans delta 2. Um, but in essence, you can remove uh, a carbon from that. Now, your, once you have this trans delta 2, cis delta 4 now, so in this period here, you've moved this delta 6 now to delta 4. Um, the steps aren't shown here. It's not very, you don't have to um, know how, much, how that happens. It's not that important. Basically, these carbons were removed um, for your acetyl-CoA. Um, and so there's a different enzyme that is able to break those carbons in the middle of the molecule. And so now you have your delta 2 and your cis delta 4. And so you're you're going to have a reductase that will convert um, it back to a transdental 3. Um, and so this is a 2,4-dienyl-CoA reductase. And so you basically take those two um, double bonds and you pass the energy into NADP, or you use NADPH um, in order to introduce that hydrogen to get rid of one of the double bonds. And then you generate a um, trans delta 3. So now we're back at the 3 position. Okay, and then after you have that, you are going to use an isomerase. Um, and then your isomerase is going to generate a trans delta 2, um, which is, of course, what you need in order to go into the beta oxidization. So you go for beta oxidization for, and you get five acetyl coas out of that. Okay, but that's not all. There is a few more things to talk about. We have odd number fatty acids, we have medium chain, short chain, and our very long chain fatty acids, as well as branch chain fatty acids. So oxidation of long, odd chain fatty acids is pretty straightforward, again, as long as it's saturated. Um, if it's unsaturated, it'll have to continue this way until it gets to a double bond, for example. So oxidation of odd chain fatty acids is going to continue, but at the end, when the final split occurs, you get a propanyl CoA, which is a three carbon, and then you get an acetyl CoA. Now our acetyl CoA, of course, is gonna to go to the TCA cycle, um, but something has to happen with the propanyl CoA. And so what happens is this is a three carbon, and so remember what's in the TCA cycles are going to be our four carbons, um, we can enter as a two carbon, but we really can't enter as a three carbon. And so we're going to take this three carbon propanyl CoA and we're going to add a carbon to it. So here's our bicarbonate, and this is a propanyl CoA carboxylase. And so, similar to our um, acetyl CoA carboxylase, this one is associated with biotin. So, biotin again is going to bring in your carbon and it's going to make sure that it gets transferred to your propanyl CoA. This is going to generate our D-methylmalino-CoA, and we have an epimerase for, specific for the methylmalino-CoA, and this epimerase is going to generate an L-methylmalino-CoA. Now, in order to get this back into the TCA cycle, we have to take this methylmalino-CoA and generate succinyl-CoA, which is, of course, part of the TCA cycle. And this requires a mutase, methylmalino-CoA mutase, in conjunction with coenzyme vitamin B12. And so this is going to allow your methylmalino-CoA now to become succinyl-CoA. And so succinyl-CoA, of course, enters the TCA cycle or is part of it. Now for medium chain fatty acids, these are uh, more water soluble. So these cannot be stored in adipose tissue. They have to be used up. So after a meal, they will enter the blood, go into the liver, and then they'll be transported to the mitochondria matrix by transporters, um, monocarboxylate transporters, and then they're going to be activated to our acetyl-CoA derivatives and undergo beta oxidization. Um, medium chain acyl-CoA synthetase is going to have a broad specificity for these medium chain fatty acids, and they're going to form in addition to um, activating your medium chain fatty acids, they will also um, add CoAs with aspirin. Um, and they can do this with different drugs, valparate and benzoate as well. 
And then these guys are going to be conjugated to glycine and they get excreted from the urine. So this is how these medium chain acyl-CoA synthases can help with these xenobiotics and getting them out of your body. Now, if you do see an increase of medium chain fatty acids or small chain fatty acids that are glycinated, have the acyl glycine in the urine, in addition with acyl carnitines or dicarboxic acids, this could indicate fatty acid disorders. A common de deficiency is a medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, and this will lead to octanoglycine in the urine. Um, and which is, uh, again, a common deficiency, and it can be in this octanoglycine is going to be measured, measurable. So beta oxidization occurs mostly in your mitochondria, and that's because most of our fatty acids are those um, long-chain fatty acids. However, some fatty acids are called very long-chain fatty acids, so they cannot get into the mitochondria matrix through the carnitine process. And so those have to, have to be oxidized in the peroxisome. Others that cannot are branch chain fatty acids. The enzymes for um, metabolizing those branches are not in the mitochondria. And so those are only found in the peroxisome. And there's also microso microsomal omega oxidization. And so that's just what it is, it's omega as it works on the omega end, and that occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. So in the proctosome, you have their very long chain fatty acids. It will undergo beta oxidization in your proctosome up to a point where it's about four to six carbons. And then it will, the four to six carbons will be released and it will continue its um, be oxidized in the mitochondria. It is gonna yield the acetyl-CoA as well as NADH. Um, your first enzyme in the beta proxosomal beta oxidization is going to generate hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide in the proxosome, it's neutralized by catalase. And this first step, however, there is no energy. So you, you lose those first few carbons, um, you get no energy out of that. So this is in contrast to beta oxidization in the mitochondria. So here, we'll go through this, but in essence, you have your um, very long chain fatty acids, such as a, let's say 22, 20, something like that. And then your very first step, you do transfer those electrons to FAD. Um, however, oxygen will pick up those electrons and create hydrogen peroxide in the peroxisome. So our beta, our very long chain fatty acids are going to be oxidized only in peroxisomes. And again, they're going to continue to be oxidized until they're about four to six. Some long chain fatty acids can also be oxidized in the peroxisome as well. So that's why there's a little bit of overlap about 20 down to about 18, 20, 22 also can be. Long chain fatty acyl-CoA synthetase is in the peroxisome membrane. So your acyl-CoA derivatives are also going to enter the peroxisome by transporters, but they don't use carnitine. Um, the first ox enzyme in the peroxisome is an oxidase, and so that's going to generate your hydrogen peroxide. So this is just a picture from your book, and so the peroxisomes are going to um, form one instead of just all acetyl-CoAs, it forms, or FAD one hydrogen peroxide, one acetyl-CoA, and one NADH per, per spiral. So you have your very long chain fatty acid, you have your very long chain acyl-CoA synthetase, you're going to activate your very long chain fatty acid, it crosses the peroxisome membrane, it goes through the peroxisome spiral, and you're going to generate hydrogen peroxide, you're going to get an acetyl-CoA, and NADH, and then they're going to be become short chain fatty acids and medium chain fatty acids. And then you're going to have your transport systems also in place. You have your carnitine transport system, which will be able to get your acetyl-CoA out of the peroxisome and into the mitochondria matrix. You also have your transport system for your medium and small chain fatty acids. 
and these will enter and exit the, exit the peroxisome and enter your mitochondria. Um, and then they can be further oxidized. So for oxidation in your peroxisome, there's four enzymes. The first is going to be an oxidase. The second is going to be a hydratase to add water, similar. The next is going to be a dehydrogenase. And then you're going to have a thiolase to form that acetyl-CoA. So very similar. The very first enzyme is really the major difference um, in the peroxisome. So the acetyl-CoA medium chain and small chain fatty acids all are going to go to the mitochondria to complete the oxidation and then NADH gets carried um, by the shuttle system. So remember the shuttle systems we talked about to get NADH from the cytosol into the mitochondria, um, the malate, aspartate shuttle system for example, um, those are all be what NADH uses. Um, you have the medium chain acetyl-CoA and small chain acetyl-CoA converted to acyl carnitine by the carnitine octo octoinal transferase, that's that cot. Um, the acyl carnitines diffuse into the mitochondria. Uh, small chain fatty acid carnitine gets converted back to CoA um, by either the um, that same enzyme that should be, yeah, CPT2, so that's the same enzyme, um, the carnitine transferase that was used by your long chain fatty acids. Um, and then they can be metabolized. So hydrogen peroxide is gonna be made in your peroxisome, but it also gets neutralized by catalase. So your peroxisomes uh, are going to be in every cell. Um, your fatty acyl-CoA oxidase, which is that first step, is what generates hydrogen peroxide, which get neutralized by catalase and converts it to water and oxygen. Um, peroxisome enzymes are confined, similar to lysosomal enzymes, confined to the peroxisomes. Now another is our branch chain fatty acids. Do I have that? So this is branch chain. Phytanic acid, which is um, commonly found in fish and dairy products, we also take in our um, into our bodies, and so you have to deal with the branch chain you do that through an alpha oxidation uh, and this is going to have to occur before beta oxidization can continue in the peroxisome so it doesn't matter the length of the fatty acid if it is a branch chain fatty acid it has to go through the peroxisome so you have a presence of a methyl group on the beta carbon and that's going to prevent beta oxidization and the fatty acids have to be um, broken down by removing a carbon from the carboxyl end. So in the peroxisome, again, you're going to have phytanic acid from our diet. Um, and this is going to um, have a methyl group on that beta carbon. And so you're going to have to um, convert it, or you have to get rid of those uh, that methyl group in order to continue on beta oxidization. So your, um, you have a phytanol-CoA synthetase, which is then going to um, generate phytanol-CoA, coenzyme A. And then you're going to have a hydroxylase, which is going to require iron, um, and it's going to generate succinate from that. Uh, it's going to use alpha-ketoglutarate and generate succinate. And this is going to generate an alpha hydroxy coa this is then going to have a lyase. Uh, lyase is going to form this pristonal, um, which can then be uh, undergo beta oxidation. So the, the pristonic acid will undergo beta oxidation, similar to what we saw before, um, and it will lead to um, hydrogen peroxide for that first step, lead to an NADH, um, acetyl-CoA, etc. Uh, you're going to continue the beta oxidization again until you get to a smaller um, fatty acid. So 
we're going to have, for example, um, from this prostanol, you're going to get a propanil CoA, which that can leave the peroxisome, go into the mitochondria, and become succinate, and then continue on the TCA cycle. Um, and then you're, uh, you're going to continue with your beta oxidization until it gets down to a small chain, small chain or medium chain fatty acid. Defects in alpha oxidation lead to increases of phytanic acid, and this can lead to a disease, a refusum disease, which is a neurologic disorder. And this is an autosomal recessive um, genetic disease. Now, another oxidization is omega oxidation, and this is going to be part of the endoplasmic reticulum. There are enzymes in the ER that are able to work on the omega carbon and break down uh, fatty acids in this way. This is going to be carried out by the cytochrome P450, CYP family of enzymes, specifically CYP4A and CYP4F. There are many CYP family members. Many of them are in the liver and in the gut, and they're there to metabolize um, toxin or to metabolize different products. So for example, avocados have to be metabolized by a cytochrome P450. Um, grapefruit is metabolized by a cytochrome P450. Your aspirin, alcohol, um, ethanol, all of those are metabolized by these, this big family of proteins. Um, so not surprising, they're gonna be very abundant in liver and kidneys, and also there's gonna be some in the gut. Uh, basically, you have a fatty acid, and you have um, oxidase reactions, and then you're going to get a fatty ome omega hydroxy acid. So you don't have to go too much into the process of this. It is a very minor process, unless there is something wrong with beta oxidization, and then, of course, you will have an increase of those P450s made. Um, via you know transcription translation and have more of them and then they can compensate a little bit if there are defects in beta oxidation. There are some defects with the carnitine deficiency so that you cannot get your very long chain fatty acids into the mitochondria matrix or there could be a deficiency of any of those beta oxidation enzymes and there are many of them um, so there's a lot of redundancy in beta oxidation such that um, your medium chain um, synthetases can work on some small ones and some of the very large can work on the large etc so um, there is there can be defects in beta oxidization but they're um, not very common um, so what is the role of proxosomal alpha beta well alpha beta of course uh, alpha is going to be for your branch chain so all your branch chains have to go through alpha. Um, your beta is going to be for your very long chain. And that's because the very long chain fat, fatty acosynthetase is only in the peroxisome membrane, it's not in the mitochondria membrane. Your omega is um, going to be in your, for your omega carbons, is kind of a backup system. But one thing to keep in mind is these are not feedback regulated. So if you have a branch chain coming in, your peroxisome is ready to metabolize it. If you have a very long chain fatty acid coming in, your peroxisome is ready to metabolize it. So those are always on, and part of the reason is because we don't store very long chain fatty acids or branch chain fatty acids, so you have to metabolize those. Um, the function of them is to decrease levels of water-insoluble fatty acids, also to help with xenobiotic compounds, and if any of these accumulate, they can be toxic to the cells. So our next topic is going to be on regulation. So we're gonna talk about regulation at the level of insulin and glucagon, of course, fed and fasting states. Um, insulin is during fed state, glucose high. Glucagon is fasting state, glucose low. So it just makes sense when energy is needed you're going to have fatty beta oxidation. When energy is not needed, you're going to favor fatty acid synthesis. So both of those pathways are going to be linked together through regulation. So in general, we have our, homo our homo hormones, 
and they are going to supply or control the release of fatty acids or not. So in the case of insulin, your adipose tissue will not be releasing fatty acids. Um, they will instead be storing fatty acids. Glucagon will be the reverse. Your, um, your adipose tissue will be releasing fatty acids. And so depending on the hormone, glucagon, epinephrine, you're going to increase your fatty acids. And so this will be taken up into the cells and you're going to activate your fatty acids, making them fatty acyl-CoA. You then are going to transport these fatty acids into the mitochondria. They're going to go through beta oxidation and you're going to get energy. Now some points of this can be regulated. So once you get your activated CoA, remember this has other fates. And so it makes sense that this would be regulated. So if you don't need energy, you want to block your fatty, your activated fatty acyl CoA from going into the uh, mitochondria matrix to undergo beta oxidation. And so this is going to be regulated by something called malino CoA. Okay, and malino CoA is made from um, acetyl CoA that's in the cytoplasm. So we haven't talked yet about how that occurs, but basically acetyl CoA and malonyl CoA are going to be important for fatty acid synthesis. And so it makes sense that if you're synthesizing fatty acids, you want to shut down breaking down the fatty acids. So the presence of malonyl CoA in the cyto cytosol will um, block the carnitine um, transferase 1. So that's remember in that um, outer mitochondria membrane. And so it'll prevent the fatty acyl carnitine formation so you can't get it into the um, mitochondria. Another is the um, ratio of NAD, FAD, so those ratios, and also the ATP, ADP ratios. So we'll go over those in a little bit. So one thing to consider also, remember your fatty acyl CoA has to be has to have an added um, coenzyme A in the mitochondria matrix. So the CoA mitochondria pool is also important. Um, you have to have enough of that CoA available to generate fatty acyl CoA from the carnitine. And remember that your acetyl CoA will enter the TCA cycle, citrate synthase, and will recycle that CoH pool. Um, so as long as you're you're feeding in your acetyl CoA from your beta oxidation, you can continue maintaining that CoA pool. So back to malonyl CoA. Malonyl CoA is going to be um, the synthesis of your fatty acids. Your key enzymes for regulating this are acetyl CoA carboxylase and the carnitine acetyl transferase. Now your acetyl CoA carboxylase shown here is going to be active when it is um, dephosphorylated so that's that insulin specific phosphatase will dephosphorylate that and when that's dephosphorylated you can make malonyl coa and then malonyl coa can block fatty acid um, breakdown because malonyl coa is going to build fatty acids and then in the presence of glucagon you're going to add a phosphate to this acetyl coa carboxylase and it's going to shut down now you're going to decrease the amount of malonyl CoA, and that will decrease that negative, um, uh, that negative regulation of your um, carnitine acyl transferase one. And so now you can start doing beta oxidation. So in general, this is just a, a more about what I just said. But in general, when fatty acid synthesis is on, beta oxidation is off. And when synthesis is off, beta oxidation is on. Similar to the insulin glucagon story that we were talking about with respect to glycogen. Um, glycogen, of course, during insulin, you're going to build glycogen. And so you're going to, all the enzymes that are necessary to build it will be active when they're dephosphorylated. And then when you want to break down glycogen, all the enzymes to break them down will be um, activated when they are phosphorylated. And it's the same thing with this beta oxidation, same sort of pattern. Okay, so everything goes back to what we've always been talking about. You have your protein kinase A, which is going to phosphorylate, and so that's going to be present when you have glucagon. 
um, so that story doesn't change. And this is just another enzyme that PKA is going to regulate through uh, phosphorylation. In addition, on the other side, that insulin phosphatase, this is also another enzyme that, tar that the phosphatase targets. Um, the other is ADP-ATP ratios. ATP-ADP ratios, the rate of ATP use will obviously control the rate of the electron transport chain as well as the TCA cycle. Um, and so, Again, it's going to depend on availability of our electron acceptors um, in beta oxidation. So we're going to need a pool of NAD, we're going to need a pool of FAD. Um, and so a lot, as long as those are available, then we can continue to do beta oxidation as well. Okay, and so finally, let's just talk about our ketone bodies. So our ketone bodies um, are going to be made in the liver. Uh, and these are going to be a major fuel during fasting. So some tissues will really like ketone bodies, so they're going to completely oxidize them. The liver is going to form the ketone bodies, but they cannot use ketone bodies. They don't have the enzymes to break down ketone bodies, and so that's why they make them and release them. Skeletal muscles love ketone bodies. They are going to convert ketone bodies to acetyl-CoA, and then they're going to oxidize them completely in the TCA cycle. So there are two main ketone bodies that our body can use for energy. We have our beta-hydroxybutyrate and we have our acetoacetate. And they're interconverted through a um, beta-hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase. Um, and so they can go back and forth between both of the species. So in general, you're going to have, again, fatty acids. So we're in the fasting state, so the liver is not going to use glucose. So it's only going to use fatty acids for energy. Fatty acids are going to go to beta oxidation and acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA can generate acetoacetate. Acetoacetate can be released into the blood. Or acetoacetate can be converted to beta-hydroxybutyrate, and then beta-hydroxybutyrate can be added to the blood. Now, if you look at the pathway, acetoacetate goes to acetyl-CoA. So when you are catabolizing ketone bodies, if you have acetoacetate, it just is a simple set back to acetyl-CoA. If you're metabolizing beta-hydroxybutyrate, you have to go through acetoacetate in order to generate acetyl-CoA. And so that's sort of shown here, where the beta-hydroxybutyrate has to go through acetoacetate and then can become acetyl-CoA. So the first thing that has to happen is that we're going to have to make our ketone bodies. So in order to make ketone bodies, and this is happening in the mitochondria matrix for the acetyl-CoA, you have that thiolase, um, which is the last reaction of the fatty acid oxidation, is reversible. So thiolase can generate two acetyl-CoAs, or it can be reversed to acetyl, um, acetyl acyl coa um, and only when you have high levels of acetyl coa will you generate the precursor to your ketone bodies so this means that the liver has plenty of fatty acids has plenty of energy and now can start re releasing ketone bodies so you have your acetyl acetyl coa and you're going to add another acetyl coa and this is going to be through a 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutarol-CoA synthase. That's this guy here. Um, and this is going to generate a 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutarol-CoA, which is an intermediate. Um, and then you have a lyase, HMG lyase, which will release an acetyl-CoA and generate acetoacetate. Now, acetoacetate is going to um, be able to leave the um, liver, the mitochondria matrix, and it can go into the blood. Or it can be reduced to beta-hydroxybutyrate, and that can enter the blood. Now, why this is important is because acetoacetate can also spontaneously form acetone. And once you form acetone, you lose all the, you lose this. So you lose the carbons, no energy. 
So, and this of course is spontaneous. So it's gonna happen at, to some level all the time. Um, and so that is why you wanna have uh, the beta hydroxybutyrate be able to control, contain those carbons because beta hydroxybutyrate cannot become acetone. So under normal conditions, your acetoacetate to beta hydroxybutyrate is about one to one. Um, these are all three different ketone bodies uh, and the NADH NAD ratio will impact how much acetoacetate versus beta hydroxybutyrate um, is present. So when you have more um, NAD, you're going to push it towards acetoacetate. When you have more NADH, you're going to push it towards beta hydroxybutyrate. So when you have plenty of energy, you're going to go more towards your beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, and when you have your NAD plus pool available, it'll go towards acetoacetate. Now, oxidation of a ketone bodies is going to occur almost in every tissue except for the liver and the red blood cell. Neither can use ketone bodies. Ketone bodies get transported in the blood to the tissues. Um, in the mitochondria matrix of whatever tissue picks them up, they can metabolize both acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Uh, but first, beta-hydroxybutyrate must go through acetoacetate in order to be used for energy. So this is basically the oxidation of ketone bodies. You have our beta-hydroxybutyrate here, and we have a dehydrogenase, which uses NAD, and this will generate acetoacetate. And then you have a succinyl CoA, acetoacid CoA transferase, and this is going to take um, succinyl CoA and generate succinate, and also aceto, acetoacetyl CoA. And then through a phylase, you are going to generate those two acetyl CoAs. They're going to come be able to enter the TCA cycle, and you're going to have energy. Okay, so. During um, uh, fasting, so depending on the number of days of fasting, um, you're going to use different fuels. So fatty acids are, of course, going to be what our bodies use during, in between meals. Um, it also can be used when you have a high fat diet, when you're exercising and need to tap into your fuel sources, and during starvation, of course. Lipolysis is going to be stimulated by glucagon, it's going to be prevented by insulin, and also our stress um, hormones will also stimulate lipolysis. The brain will be able to use ketone bodies at a certain point, especially during starvation, and it will save glucose um, for red blood cells. So you can see that as your, your um, starvation um, continues or go, is prolonged, your level of beta-hydroxybutyrate will increase. Now remember your beta-hydroxybutyrate um, was increasing when there was um, enough NADH. So you're going to favor beta-hydroxybutyrate um, as you progress in uh, your, um, your fasting. Of course, glucose levels will always remain because your body is also going to be generating glucose. Your free fatty acids stay pretty stable throughout, so your adipose tissue will release them um, steadily, and then your acetoacetate levels will um, be pretty stable too, and that is because you want to prevent, of course, your carbon from be, for, uh, being converted into acetone. So the preferential use of ketone bodies are going to be skeletal muscle, heart, um, and liver will use fatty acids in fasting. Ketone bodies will be used by brain cells. Um, it'll also be in, used by intestinal mucosal cells. These are important for transporting fatty acids into your blood. Adipocytes are going to store fatty acids in tag. In the fetus, ketone bodies can cross the placenta. Um, liver and red blood cells can never oxidize ketone bodies. So regulation of ketone bodies. So again, you have your fatty acids from your adipocytes increase. You're not in a fed state, you're in a fasting state. Um, you're going to inhibit malonyl-CoA, so you're not going to be building fatty acids, so you have a decrease of malonyl-CoA. 
Your beta oxidation is going to give you ATP, so you're going to have a buildup of NADH. Oxaloacetate is going to be converted to malate if NADH is high, and this it can be fed into gluconeogenesis, which we haven't talked about yet. Acetyl-CoA will uh, form ketone bodies, and this is ketogenesis. So you have an increase of acetyl-CoA, so this is going to generate your ketones. Okay, so this is the end. So in general, fatty acids, of course, are going to be a major fuel, especially during fasting. The liver is able to convert fatty acids to ketone bodies by an increase of acetyl-CoA. These can be used by the brain during prolonged fasting. If it's just a simple overnight fast, your, fat, your muscle cells will use ketone bodies. Fatty acids are going to be released by the adipose tissue. They have to get activated in order to be useful in the cell to do anything that you want, their cell wants to do. You're going to go through beta oxidation to generate ATP. Um, beta oxidation is going to be regulated by NADH, acetyl-CoA, as well as hormones. Ketone bodies, acetone, acetoacetate, and our beta hydroxybutyrate are going to be formed in the liver, never used by the liver. The acetoacetate and hydroxybutyrate are going to be fuels for all other cells except for liver and red blood cells. And they're going to generate acetyl-CoA that can go into the TCA cycle. Overproduction of ketone bodies in uncontrolled diabetes can lead to acidosis or ketosis. Um, and also severe reduced calorie intake can also have the same effect of acidosis or ketosis.